For today's critical thought, we're going back to basics. As I want to discuss essentially two different philosophies when it comes to creating gameplay for your title. Now we got two different footages we're going to switch to in a few minutes, but before we do that, I want to talk about kind of why this is important to consider. When it comes to game design, the more elements you can set in stone or compartmentalize early on in development will only help you when it comes to designing a game over the long term. Because without having a foundation of knowing what your core gameplay loop is, what your primary game systems are, things like that, it can lead to a case where you're kind of spinning your wheels or taking two steps forward, three steps back. With that said though, this is not a magic uh, one-size-fits-all solution that will make every game successful. And this video is definitely aimed more for students or first-time developers. But with that said, when it comes to the growth and evolution of gameplay over the last 30 years, there's essentially two distinct schools that we see. The first kind is mechanical gameplay. This is where the game is built around the designer creating a set or focused experience for the player. Essentially, you are building, I guess, a quote-unquote a movie, or you're trying to build something that you want the player to experience this specific way, solve it in this specific solution. So, many early platformers are great examples of mechanical gameplay. Due to the constraints of the level design and the camera orientation, you literally will only have one or two ways of making a proper jump or dodging an obstacle. Now, while that's the easy example, we can even point to many modern games today that make use of scripted events, uh, linear puzzles, sections like that. So, when we play a game like The Last of Us or Uncharted, and the player is put into a specific situation, or in the Tomb Raider games where Laura must quickly escape and exploding building or she gets trapped in an arena fight. These would also be examples of mechanical gameplay because the player essentially loses any real control or agency over the situation and must abide by what the designer is doing. Now we can even point to of course adventure gameplay and puzzle solving as well. Puzzles are a really great example of mechanical gameplay because well you either solve it or you're not moving forward. Now, with that said though, the other kind is going to be what we're going to kind of coin as reactionary gameplay. This is where the player is forced to react or respond to events that are going on in game, and ultimately are the kind of the judge or the reason whether or not they're going to succeed or fail. In this case, the designer is not building a fixed experience. And instead, simply putting all the pieces in play and then letting the player kind of go forward with it. And there is a lot to unpack with that. But we're going to load up some game footages now. We're going to start with mechanical gameplay, talk a little bit more about that and its limitations, and then we'll get to reactionary uh, after that one. But first, as always, a quick shout out to our Patreon backers. Thank you to our Patreon backers, and if you'd like to continue this discussion on game design, be sure to check out our Discord channel, link down below. Here's footage from our play of I Wanna Be The Guy, and this would certainly be an example of mechanical gameplay. As we said in the last part, all Kaizo-based design is an example of a mechanical form of gameplay. As in, the game itself, or the game space, does not allow for any real sense of improvisation. Now, with that said though, we are not going to be counting trigger breaks, glitches, exploits like that. The stuff that you see for speedruns. Because most of the time, the developer did not account for any of that when they were building their game. And it's often considered good design not to require understanding glitches or things like that when it comes to gameplay. But with I Want to Be the Guy here and with a lot of mechanical based gameplay, these sections are built around, again, one way of getting through them. And you're going to probably be seeing a lot more deaths over how many minutes long the section is going to be. But the beauty about mechanical gameplay is that it really condenses everything down to being 
almost puzzle-esque. Like we said in the last part, you can certainly consider traditional puzzle design in adventure games a form of mechanical gameplay. But many Kaizo games are built around this idea of, I have essentially a very long puzzle. How do I solve this? How do I get around it? And from there, it's up to the player to kind of figure it all out. And when you get to that point of solving it, it does feel really good. There, we just missed it. <laughs> but when we talk about the form of mechanical gameplay in modern games, it's less about a puzzle, and it's more about eliciting a specific reaction or response from the player. And that can be very tricky to do right. And it does lead to some of the issues a lot of people have with modern games, where it gets to this point that you're not really playing the game your own way, you're kind of just jumping through the hoops of the designer's intentions. And in some cases, this can be useful. Again, if you're trying to create an emotional scene, or do something that's going to make the player react or respond a certain way, then you want to take control away from them. But, if you want the player, if you're trying to build your game around the player themselves, making choices or doing things like that, mechanical gameplay does feel like it's hamstringing them along. In an earlier video and post, we talked about the challenge or the difficulty of player choice. And player choice is the complete opposite of mechanical gameplay. If the player is able to make a decision or do something that affects the game, then that should be taken into account. As we've talked about earlier with the Assassin's Creed Backlash, that's a great example of what happens when mechanical gameplay gets in the way of reactionary gameplay. If you're telling me for the last 30 hours that everything that I'm doing and all my choices are going to matter, and then lock me into a situation where they don't, that can be viewed as cheating the player. And again, it's not something that you want to get into as a designer. And why most games will either focus on either, or I'm sorry, on one or the other. But while we've been dying and I won't be the guy for like the last, I don't know, I don't have my clock up right now. But we'll move on to reactionary gameplay and talk a little bit more about what it means to let the player kind of get involved with what's going on in the gameplay next. Reactionary gameplay can truly be felt with this generation's Souls-like games. So what we have here is Neo, and this is the final mission of the game through the DLC. And Neo, Dark Souls, Bloodborne, The Surge, you name it, are all great examples of reactionary gameplay. And we could even go as far back as some of the heights of the action genre, with titles like Ninja Gaiden, Bayonetta, and even stuff like uh, Devil May Cry, and again, many, many more. But the key component of reactionary gameplay is that as the player, I don't know exactly how things are going to work. Like that guy just appearing and disappearing, I think that's more of a bug. But it's up to the player to, as the name implies, react to the enemies and their patterns. So the bosses of any Souls... Wow, I just got like stomp there. <laughs> the bosses of any Souls-like game are great examples of this. They are built on, as we've defined, as a random pattern. Meaning that I know the exact attacks a boss is going to do from an animation and strategy standpoint. I don't know when they're going to actually do them. So it's up to you to be constantly, essentially improvising the fight. So right here you can see me trying to deal with this guy, and I don't know if I actually beat him on this one go. Ooh. But when it comes to reactionary gameplay, you're constantly on guard, and it looks like we didn't beat him that time, about getting through the game. Roguelikes are another great example of this. As we've said, a roguelike is built on several hard elements, such as what biomes are going to show up, what enemy types, what possible events, but everything else is shuffled or randomized for the player on each experience. 
reactionary games are meant to be replayed, whether it is by choice as a roguelike, or by kind of force in a souls like when you are dying and having to repeat sections. But unlike a mechanical game, it's not a case of me just doing the same exact thing again and again and hoping I get it right. Here it's how can I react to this and essentially perform every move optimally. So another good example would be when we did the Valkyrie Queen fight from God of War the more up-to-date one at the highest difficulty. That was a good five to six hours to get about 15 minutes of actual footage of me winning that fight. But that is a perfect encapsulation of reactionary gameplay. Again, learning that fight was about me picking up on every pattern the boss was going to do. But I had no idea when she was going to do those moves. And that can be a bit frustrating. Again, if mechanical gameplay is about you defining an experience that you want the player to go for or elicit, reactionary gameplay is about saying, okay, it's up to you, you know, figure this all out. And it can be not only harder to design, but also harder for the player to understand. This is where a lot of the difficulty concerns come into play when it comes to a game like Demon's Souls or Dark Souls. As we've talked about, those games are not, uh, they're not really designed to be overly difficult. They're just harder at the beginning compared to other action-based titles. Because the game leaves so much up to you to figure out. How do patterns work? What's a good build? How do I properly build my character? And messing up on any of those, well, will lead to you dying or not being able to continue. And it can be frustrating as a player to essentially be given the uh, rope to hang themselves with, especially if they don't know that they're doing it in the process. And if that comes to pass for some players, they may just get frustrated and stop playing the game to begin with. And it can be harder, and like, this is why it can be very difficult to get people to understand the joy of a roguelike game. Because you're essentially telling the player, yeah, you're going to be repeating this at least 50 to 100 runs uh, at minimum. Enjoy. But when it comes to building your game, it is important to consider what kind of audience and what kind of design you're going to be intending. And like we said in the last part, typically reactionary or mechanical gameplay are kept separate. You don't want to be building a set experience and then basically letting the player make all manner of weird choices and control because then you could upset that. For instance, if you want the player to be scared or be weak, but then they can build the most powerful build imaginable, it doesn't work like that. Likewise, if you're telling the player that you can do whatever you want and then come to a section where, hey, you didn't build yourself for fire damage, well, you now lose. That's also not that fun either. Now, with Neo over here, there are the various builds, and you can get some freedom in it. But a lot of people did have trouble designing their character. And if you are going to feature a reactionary gameplay or letting the player make choices, you want to spell out as cleanly or as clearly as possible so that they can figure out what it is they're doing, how it can be improved, and what it means to kind of start building things up. Disgaea is another good example of reactionary gameplay despite how abstract it is. And the whole reason is that the game basically says, here's all these uh, mechanics and systems, enjoy. Do it all, figure it out. And if you can, you are going to be overpowered. And if you can't, then there's a good 30 to 40 hour long campaign in the process. But to begin to wrap things up for this play, because I don't know how many more times I can be killed over the course of this video, both designs have their purpose. And as a developer, it's important to figure out just what you're trying to build your game around. As we said at the start, if you can compartmentalize this as quickly as possible in terms of your overall design, 
This can help you when it comes to deciding what aspects of your game you're going to build or focus on. Again, it's the same thing with your core gameplay loop. All decisions and design should stem from that, as well as what kind of gameplay you want to build. You don't want to be changing your entire game up halfway to three quarters of the way through development. And to end things here, here's my question for everybody watching. Do you have a preference when it comes to the games you like to play? Chances are, if you're a longtime follower of mine, you probably like reactionary gameplay more than mechanical, especially if you are a roguelike fan. But can you think of examples of both that go to that go too far? Whether it is a mechanical game that is just so railroaded that it just feels like you're, you know, putting on a putting on airs or going through the emotions of playing it, or a game that is so reactionary that it just feels like it's completely out of control and you just don't know what the heck is going on. But thank you so much for watching this video. Be sure to check back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom where exam the art and science of games. Until our next video here, thanks for tuning in. If you're looking for another book about game design, be sure to check out my first title, 20 Essential Games to Study, out now. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoy things, be sure to do all the liking and subscribing that the kids are doing these days. Check out our Discord channel link down below where we hang out and chat game design, and come back later tonight for our regular streamings. But that's it, and tune in for more great content here and on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games.